some believers think that Paul discouraged Christians from praying in tongues. Paul writes, let love be your highest goal, but you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God since people won't be able to understand you. Let's stop there. Look at this for a second. He says that when you desire the special abilities, you should desire prophecy over the gift of tongues. He's saying, if you're praying in tongues, you're talking only to God and people aren't able to understand you. But if you, if you pray, or if, excuse me, if you prophesy, you're strengthening others, encouraging others, comforting others. And so he's saying a person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally. That's a fact. But the one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. So some will take that to mean that Paul the apostle is telling us to not pray in tongues. But listen to this carefully. Paul was not saying that praying in tongues was bad. He was saying that prophecy is better in the context of the church. He was not saying that the gift of tongues has no benefit. He was saying that the gift of prophecy is more beneficial in the context of the church. He's not saying that the gift of tongues is bad, He's saying that the gift of prophecy is better. This is not a matter of condemnation, but of comparison. He was comparing the two in the context of church assembly and saying in this specific instance, the gift of prophecy is better because it benefits everyone. So this is an often misunderstood text. And because individuals believe that Paul was a little bit hesitant with the gift of tongues, they feel justified in their hesitation with the gift also. So there's been this impression created in the church that the gift of tongues is something that we should just kind of tolerate but not celebrate. Well, that's not at all uh, what we see in Scripture. In fact, he encouraged it. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 5, I wish you could all speak in tongues, but even more, I wish you could all prophesy. There, we, there again, we see that comparison for prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless someone interprets what you are saying so that the whole church will be strengthened now watch this in first corinthians chapter 14 verse 39 so my dear brothers and sisters be eager to prophesy and don't forbid speaking in tongues well it doesn't sound to me at all like paul the apostle is hesitating with it or has reservations about it. No, he's simply placing certain parameters, again, for the context of public church assembly. Now, let's take a look at this other myth here. Praying in tongues should not be practiced in public. Now, this is interesting because almost every instance that we see in regards to the gift of tongues was done corporately and publicly. And so we look at what Paul was trying to address. Here, here is the context. Imagine you go into a church service and there is this beautiful flow of the preaching of the word. You're sitting in the service, you're being edified by the message. The person sitting next to you is being edified by the message. The visitors who've come to church for the first time in years are being edified by the message. They're being convicted, corrected, confronted, comforted. The truth is going forth. Lives are being transformed. And in the middle of this great delivery of this sermon, somebody stands up in the public assembly and demands the collective attention of the room to begin to pray in tongues without an interpreter. Well, which would have been better for the preaching of the word to continue, which was edifying people, or for everyone to stop and listen to this person stand and give a tongue without an interpreter. Well, this is what kept happening. And by the way, the prophetic tongue looks just like that when it's done properly. In the context of public church assembly, an individual will stand, pray in tongues, someone will interpret. That is how a prophetic tongue works. So that's what Paul the apostle is trying to address. He's addressing a very specific problem. Context, 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 context. You'll often see this portion of scripture, proof texts, where Paul is regulating this gift. People who don't like the gift of speaking in tongues for personal and emotional reasons will pull out that one scripture, disregard the context, 
and then try to apply that text as if, it's a, as if it has universal application when it comes to the gift of speaking in tongues in general. But that's not at all what Paul is saying. Paul, again, is addressing this chaos that was erupting in the church services. People kept standing and wanting to pray in tongues without an interpreter, thus removing any opportunity for the preaching of God's word or for the singing of spiritual songs, and nobody went home edified. That's what's being addressed. That's the problem he's trying to solve when he writes, Dear brothers and sisters, if I should come to you speaking in an unknown language, how would that help you? But if I bring you a revelation or some special knowledge or prophecy or teaching, that will be helpful. But in a church meeting, I would rather speak five understandable words to help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. He brought order. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize. When you meet together, one will sing, another will teach, Another will tell some special revelation God has given. Now, that's interesting because that right there demonstrates that God is still speaking in the church. But continuing, one will speak in tongues and another will interpret what is said. But everything that is done must strengthen all of you. So there's the concern there. If you're going to demand the collective attention of those assembled in the context of church attendance, then in that instance, whatever's being done has to benefit all. There's no use in interrupting a church service if all are not going to benefit. Now, this, however, does not mean or imply or even come close to implying that we should never pray in tongues collectively. As long as there is order, as long as, not, as, long as it's not disrupting the flow of the service, then it's not, um, it's not the problem that Paul was describing. So, for example... If in a moment of worship, the body of believers assembled is encouraged to pray in their heavenly language, they're free to do so because it's not interrupting anything, it's not out of order, and it's not taking away from the edification of the assembly at large. In fact, everyone's being edified at the same time as they pray in tongues. Or if during a worship service, someone should sing in tongues to the Lord on their own, as long as it's not disrupting the flow of the service, as, as long as it's not so distracting that it's taking away the attention from the moment, then again, this is not in violation of the standard that Paul was raising because again, Paul was addressing a very specific problem and to say otherwise is again to proof text, which is problematic when it comes to biblical application. So this doesn't mean that we should never pray in tongues collectively. In fact, we have biblical examples of believers praying in tongues collectively. Acts chapter two, verse four. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Well, some might say, well, that was at the birth of Pentecost. So that was at the giving of the Holy Spirit. Well, let's take a look at Acts chapter 19. Now there's some uh, rhythm that they found to the New Testament church. Acts 19, six. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Nobody stood up and scolded the group of believers. The Holy Spirit didn't pull back and demand that they wait until a later moment to pray in tongues. Why would the Holy Spirit pour out something that is used in public if it was meant to be used in private? Why would the Holy Spirit give the gift of tongues publicly if it was only ever meant to be exercised privately. Again, context, context, context. And we have to be careful to not be emotionally dissuaded from embracing these beautiful expressions of the gift of tongues simply because we are uncomfortable with them. 1 Corinthians 14, 22 tells us plainly. So you see that speaking in tongues is a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Now, wait a minute. How is the gift of tongues supposed to be assigned to unbelievers if it's only ever meant to be used privately? That's just nonsense, guys. I'm telling you, again, a lot of this stuff, a lot of this teaching on tongues that under pre, the pretense of strong biblical doctrine is actually just emotionalism and fear and religious superstition and legalism. And because we as Believers who embrace the gift of tongues have kind of just conceded that point. Uh, we've been left to think that we have no biblical grounds for this, but I'm telling you, we have the solid biblical foundation. I want you to know it. 
Again, this gift needs to be normalized in the body of Christ. And I'm telling you, please send this to at least two or three friends of yours who are on the fence about this gift. Another myth we need to address is that tongues is only an earthly language, not a heavenly one. Again, this is another popular view that's often parroted, but doesn't have any biblical support. There is biblical support to say that the gift of tongues can manifest as an earthly language, but there is no support to say that that is the limitation of the use of the gift. Again, 1 Corinthians 14, 2, it benefits the individual. That is simply how we define the prayer language. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14. What about the book of Acts? Now, here this is interesting, and I want you to be armed with this truth as well. Uh, You'll often hear this concept uh, being thrown out. Uh, Was it prescriptive or descriptive? Prescriptive or descriptive? But you'll often notice, as is in human nature, that whenever there is a point that benefits the individual who often concedes to that, then you'll notice that they use that term, prescriptive or descriptive. But when it doesn't benefit them, you notice suddenly that term goes away. So I think that there's an inconsistency in how prescriptive and descriptive are used. Uh, But Acts chapter 2 wouldn't be prescriptive. It would be descriptive and therefore not instructional, as if, uh, at least if we're going to fall under that biblical framework. So each individual in the crowd collectively heard the group of believers speaking their personal language. Think about that. So you have a group of believers, born again, spirit-filled believers receiving the gift of tongues. And those who are listening now are hearing the group collectively pray in their individual language. This would not be possible unless the interpretation, the supernatural interpretation took place on the listener's end. I wrote this to kind of help clarify that point. To say that the gift of tongues is only spoken as an earthly language is an assumption, a big assumption. Those who insist that the gift of tongues is strictly the ability to supernaturally speak in an earthly language, um, one does not know, are asserting an assumption. Yes, we all agree that a language is being spoken. Whether or not it is earthly is debatable. Some may point to Acts 2, and yes, in that narrative, the believers were speaking in earthly languages. However, Other expressions of the gift are clearly described in the scripture. Context dictates meaning. So the cessationist can insist that the gift of tongues is strictly an earthly language, but that's all that he can do, insist upon it. The question is, what kind of language is being spoken? And there they might point to the original language. They'll say, this is just the term for languages. Yes, of course, but the context implies a supernatural language. It is a heavenly one, And again, see 1 Corinthians 14, 2 and 4. Scripture is very clear here. So if one wants to deny the gift of tongues being used in many churches today, he can do that, but he cannot pretend there isn't a legitimate biblical framework for this belief. At the very least, it must be admitted that the issue is debatable. It is definitely not cause for contention or differing views among brethren. So consider also the fact that some of the people in the crowd heard the body of Christ and they concluded they're drunk. Look at Acts 2.13. But others in the crowd ridiculed them saying, they're just drunk, that's all. What would make them say such a thing? Perhaps they heard them speaking in what many today call gibberish when it's in fact the gift of speaking in tongues. So Acts chapter two, again, it's a, it's a great description of the gift of speaking in tongues, not necessarily a prescription. Uh, so it's descriptive, not prescriptive. Also, Paul the Apostle writes about the personal prayer language. Additionally, we don't know exactly what the spiritual supernatural dynamics were in that moment. It could very well have been that the listener was supernaturally hearing their language when they spoke, as opposed to those individuals speaking that language. Again, that's speculation, but it's a point to consider. Uh, But what is clear is the fact that um, Paul the Apostle talks about that personal prayer language. Um, There's myth number four here. And I know that as you're hearing these, I'm praying that there are things clicking in your mind. Like you're going, okay, yeah, I had heard that, but I didn't realize there was no biblical support for a lot of the criticisms that were coming against that. Uh, Let me know if this has clarified things for you. Write it in the comment section below. Um, Another myth that we're going to address now, or misconception, I should say, 
is this idea that the gift of tongues is not for every believer. Now, let me clarify. You don't have to speak in tongues to be saved. You don't have to believe in the gift of speaking in tongues to be saved. You don't have to um, do any of those things that are above and beyond faith. Having said that, I think it's important that we embrace what the Holy Spirit has for us. This is not an issue that we as the body must divide over. I, I don't think we should label people who don't pray in tongues as non-believers. I don't think that we should label people who teach that tongues isn't for today as heretics. They're in error, but it's important to remember that, well, all heresy is error, not all error is heresy. So yes, people who say that the gift of tongues is not for today, people who don't acknowledge the personal prayer language, yeah, they're in grave serious error when it comes to biblical doctrine. And of course we have to pray for them and ask the Lord to open their eyes. Uh, but that doesn't mean we label them as evil or wicked. I think a lot of people um, who embrace those ideas that resist this beautiful gift of the, of, of the Holy Spirit, I think a lot of them come from a very sincere place. Um, namely, they want to get it right. They're just being given misinformation around the subject. So it, that's why it's so important we spread teachings like this. Um, so let me make that clear. I'm not saying that if you don't pray in tongues, you're not my brother, you're not my sister. And I would never label you as a non-believer. So, so rest easy in that. Uh, and, and nor should we, and I'm talking now to those of you, spirit family, who know that the gift of tongues is for today, who know that the gift of tongues is for uh, the personal prayer language as well, who know that this is a beautiful expression of the Holy Spirit. I wanna challenge you as well to not be combative or angry, um, but, but to embrace those who are still learning this in their walk with God, those who are, who, who've not quite fully surrendered in this area, pray for them because there's areas where we're lacking too. And so I want us to be rid of this mindset of elitism and division while also very clearly addressing these points. So I want to arm you with truth so that you're not uh, swept away by unbiblical doctrines. I want you to be grounded in solid biblical doctrine when it comes to the gift of tongues. Uh, but having said that, I don't want to come across as combative. We should be strong on it. We should make definite stances. Uh, we should address some of the arguments. Paul talks about casting down imaginations, tearing down strongholds, arguments that come against the truth. So we are tearing down those strongholds. We should address those arguments, but never demonize, never divide, never label another Christian as an unbeliever or say, you're not my brother, you're not my sister. That is what the devil wants. Rather, we're gonna do this with love and we're gonna see the power of the Holy Ghost spread around the world. Okay, so whenever you talk about the fact that all believers can pray in tongues, there are, there's a very specific scripture that comes up. And again, this is a misapplication of scripture that leads to a misunderstanding. But still, you'll, you'll hear this and I want you to listen for this you'll often hear a strong reaction to the term activate. You'll notice this in, 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 in certain parts of the body of Christ. And again, not our enemies. They're still growing, have grace for them. But you'll notice this. You'll, you'll, anytime you talk about activating the gift of prophecy, activating the gift of tongues, activating uh, the gift of healing, you'll notice there's this strong reaction and it's always along the same lines of response. This is how you know it's kind of just become a cliche that's parroted. And again, people parrot things and they hear it often enough that they think it's true. You'll hear them say, you cannot activate the spiritual gifts. Or they'll tell you, anytime you hear the word activate, run in the other direction because what you're about to hear is unbiblical. Well, that would depend upon what is meant when we use the term activate. Paul the apostle wrote to Timothy, stir up the gift that is in you. I mean, if we were to take the teachings of Paul today and put it on YouTube, I'm sure many would say, you can't stir up the gift. There's nothing in you that can cause that gift to manifest. There's nothing that's required of you to bring that gift's uh, manifestation or demonstration on display. But when we use the term activate, we don't mean that you can choose to receive a gift. When we use the term activate, we don't mean that you can be taught how to get a spiritual gift. Rather, when we teach activation, when we teach stirring up the gift, if you wanna use a different term, it's the same meaning. When you teach stirring up that gift, all we mean, all I mean, at least I should speak for myself, 
All I mean is that you use what God has placed in you, that you stop stifling. Well, the scripture tells us we can stifle the Holy Spirit. For example, the gift of teaching. Does that just flow out of you or do you have to study and then teach? The gift of healing. Don't you still have to pray for the sick? Don't you still have to lay hands? The gift of prophecy. Don't you still have to open your mouth and speak? Choose to say the words that God has given to you? So there are spiritual gifts that require surrender. And there is no spiritual dynamic at work in our lives that doesn't require our participation. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. What Paul the Apostle wrote, let the Holy Spirit. So when I talk about activate, it's a very simple biblical principle of participating with the Holy Spirit and doing as he instructs. Obey the Holy Spirit when it comes to your spiritual gifts. So again, when you hear that kind of talk, phrases like, oh, as soon as you hear the term activate, run the other direction, you can rest assured that there was very little study done. And again, there's that emotional reaction under the pretense of sound biblical doctrine. I believe that the gifts cannot be taught in the sense that you can't decide what gifts you get. Once the Holy Spirit has deposited a gift, then it is up to you to participate through obedience and surrender and trust and faith in the use of that gift. And this brings us to the gift of tongues. I don't believe that every believer has been given the gift of tongues and tongues interpretation. What I do believe is that every believer has a prayer language. These are different. Okay, look at what Paul wrote now. 1 Corinthians 12, go there with me, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm going to read verses 29 through 31. 1 Corinthians 12, 29 through 31. Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? Of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. But now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. Now let's set the context here. Go with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. So each one of the spiritual gifts is intended to help the body of Christ. In other words, the one who uses the gift isn't the one who benefits from the gift. We are given spiritual gifts to benefit others, not self. So the gift of faith could not be having faith. It would have to be the ability to stir faith in others. The gift of healing couldn't be being healed. It would have to be the ability to pray for others to be healed. The same would apply to every gift about which Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12. All of the spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 are others-focused, never self-focused. In other words, these aren't just spiritual functions that are to be used in your personal spiritual devotion. These are abilities given to us to be used in the context of community. Now watch this. Are we all apostles? No. Does this mean that not all of us are sent by God? Absolutely not. Does this mean that only a few can participate in the establishing of new works and ministries? Of course not. Does this mean that only a few can work to get the gospel broken into new regions and, and among new people groups? Of course not. Though there are some apostles and though not all believers are apostles, that doesn't mean that we don't all contribute somehow to the expansion of the kingdom of God. Are all prophets? No. But can every believer hear from God? Yes. Are we all teachers? No. But can every believer know and explain the word? You better hope so. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And be ready to give an answer for the hope that's within you. Well, wait a minute, Brother David, we can't all do that. We're not all teachers. Okay, not all are teachers, or I should say, not all have the office of the teacher, but all believers should know the word and be able to explain the word. 
Do all have the power to do miracles? Well, no, not everyone has the gift of miracles. Does this mean that only the believers who have the gift of miracles can ask God for miracles? Does it mean that if your child is sick in the hospital and you don't have the gift of miracles, that you shouldn't dare pray and ask God for a miracle? Does it mean that if you find yourself in a financial bind, believing God for a financial miracle, that you're somehow out of order because you don't have the quote, gift of miracles, end quote? No, not every believer has the gift of miracles as in a specific area of grace for the purpose of ministry assignment, but every believer can believe for a miracle. Do we all have the ability to speak in tongues? Wait a minute, why do we stop here and apply a different standard to this one? No one would tell you that you can't hear from God. No one would tell you that you shouldn't know and be able to explain the word. No one would tell you that you shouldn't believe for your own miracle or believe for your own healing if you don't have that gift. Why then do we discount the prayer language just because of the public use of the gift of speaking in tongues not being for everyone? And by public, I mean, again, to edify the assembled body of Christ. Context, context, context. The criticisms against the gift of tongues are all proof texts out of context based on emotion and personal preference. And so we see that what Paul is describing in 1 Corinthians 12 is a very specific set of spiritual gifts that are used as areas of ministry focus and assignment, special graces that God gives to some individuals that he doesn't give to others. But this has nothing to do with your personal devotion. This has nothing to do with your personal walk with God. This has nothing to do with your personal prayer language. Again, Paul is regulating the prophetic expression of the gift of tongues used in the context of community. He is not regulating that personal prayer language. In fact, as I mentioned before, we see that gift of tongues used regularly over and over and over and over again throughout the New Testament. Now, 1 Corinthians 14, 4 and 5, we see it. Why would Paul the apostle who wrote, I wish you could all speak in tongues. Why would Paul the apostle wish for something that was contrary to the will of God? And why would the Holy Spirit allow for that desire to be recorded in the Holy Scripture if it were indeed contrary to God's will? Not all have the gift of tongues and tongues interpretation, but every believer can pray in a personal tongue to God. So you have to look at the context of what Paul is talking about. He's not making a blanket statement about all uses of that gift, just like he's not making a blanket statement about healing or miracles. You can still believe for a miracle. You can still believe for healing, even if you don't have those gifts. And you can still use your personal prayer language, even if you don't have that expression of the gift of tongues that's used in the context of the body of Christ or public church assembly. The Bible doesn't say some were filled. It says all were filled and began speaking in tongues. Acts 2, 4, all of them were filled and began speaking in other tongues. Acts 2, 39, um, we see how Peter actually begins to describe this gift. The promise is to you, to your children, and to those who are far away. All who have been called by the Lord are God. Wait a minute. What is Peter describing here? He's saying... This promise is for you, for your children, and for everyone who has been called. Okay, that's a big statement. So everyone who's been called by God, here's what he has for you. Acts 2.33. And the Father, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see and hear today. What were they seeing? They were seeing the coming of the Holy Spirit. What were they hearing? They were hearing the use of the gift of of tongues. So what you see, the Holy Spirit, what you hear, the gift of tongues, it's for you, it's for your children, and it's for all who have been called by the Lord our God. And so this unbiblical notion that not every believer can pray in tongues, again, is a misapplication of a very specific instance that Paul was writing about. Again, he's talking about those nine spiritual gifts that are public ministry assignments, not to be used for personal devotion. This could not possibly be describing the personal prayer language. And then we see myths like the spiritual gifts are no longer in operation. 
you know, I used to I used to see the need to address this. Maybe at some point I'll address cessationism, but I'm not trying to be cynical and I'm not being facetious, but cessationism is dying all on its own. I don't think it needs much help. So I'll just say real briefly here, uh, the spiritual gifts are no longer in operation. That myth um, is based entirely on speculation, poor arguments from history and poor biblical interpretation. I mean, again, I don't, I don't even see the need really to address it as much. It, it, it has been very thoroughly debunked um, time and time again. So moving on to the other myth, uh, some will say things like, because Jesus didn't pray in tongues, neither should we. Well, of course, Jesus didn't pray in tongues. We're not saying he did. But of course, Jesus didn't pray in tongues. He was perfect. Why didn't Jesus pray in tongues? The same reason Jesus never shared a testimony of being saved from sin. He was perfect. Praying in tongues supplements my inability to pray. Jesus lacked no ability to pray. Praying in tongues helps me when I don't know what to pray. Jesus always knew what he should pray. Praying in tongues helps me to pray according to God's will. Jesus was God's will in action. So Jesus didn't need tongues because he was perfect. When you reach perfection, uh, you can say, well, Jesus didn't pray in tongues, neither should I. Um, another strange idea is that you could become demonized if you attempt to pray in tongues. Uh, there's no biblical support for this. In fact, Jesus said, if you ask your father for bread, he's not gonna give you a stone. He's not gonna give you a serpent, okay? So if you ask him for the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, he's gonna give you of the Holy Spirit. I trust not in my ability to receive of God. I trust in his ability to give to me. So I trust him when I ask. Another misconception, and by the way, the, the misconception I wanna to give to you here, uh, this next one is one of the big reasons why you probably can't pray in tongues. So if you're struggling, you're saying, I can't pray in tongues. I, I, anything I do, I just can't seem to activate that gift. If that's you, this is probably the myth you believe. That myth is that you can't control the gift of speaking in tongues. Well, Paul the apostle wrote about the regulations and the uses of it and the context of it. He encouraged you to pray naturally, pray spiritually, sing naturally, sing spiritually. And he's implying that it's under your will. The gift of tongues is used by you. God gives them the ability. It says they prayed in tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them, not forced them. We imagine when we're at the altar, as we have our hands lifted, that the Holy Spirit is gonna come down from heaven, grab our tongue and begin to shake it around for us, forcing us to pray in tongues. That's not the way it works. Again, as he enabled them, not as he forced them. All spiritual gifts require some exercise of faith on the part of the one using them. Why would speaking in tongues be any different? So you want to pray in tongues. Let's go back to what we established at the beginning. Are you one with the Lord? Yes. Is your spirit one with his spirit? Yes. Does the Holy Spirit pray for you? Yes. Does Paul the apostle write about the believer's ability to pray in the spirit, specifically when he used that term, I'm talking about tongues. Yes that when you pray in tongues, your spirit is praying. What does the book of Acts model for us? All were filled, all were filled, all were filled, all began speaking, all began speaking, all began speaking. And so it's not a matter of you receiving the gift. I believe it's already deposited in you. You already have that ability. It's a matter of participating with the Holy Spirit that the gift might be released and you might be blessed by your use of it. Help us win souls and empower Christians around the world. Become a monthly partner with David Diga Hernandez by signing up for our automatic giving plan at davidhernandezministries.com slash partner. You can also give a single gift by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Your support, single or monthly of any amount, will help us continue to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ all around the world in the power of the Holy Spirit. Get involved as we win this generation to the kingdom of God.